President Hinckley, it was a prophecy of Brigham Young that one day emperors and kings, as he put it, the wise and noble from around the world would come to Salt Lake City. Yes, sir. Do you think he had the Winter Olympics in mind? I don't know what he had in mind. I know he made the statement, but it's coming to pass. The Olympics will bring people here from everywhere. What is your concern about the biggest misconception that people from around the world may have about the place of the church in Salt Lake City? Well, I'm a, I think they may have the conception that the church is putting on the Olympics. We're not. This is the Salt Lake City Olympics. It isn't the Mormon Olympics. It isn't the church Olympics. It's the city's Olympics. We're citizens here. We're interested. We're, we want to be a part of it. We want to make people welcome. We want to have them feel at home here comfortable in every respect and have a wonderful time. But you would also want them to know that you are the largest single influence in Salt Lake City. I think they're already aware of that. <laughs> have you been worried that there could be a backlash against the church in some fashion? I haven't felt so. I don't think so. I think the perception will be positive. I think people will come to a better understanding. I think that it'll redound to our good, although as I say, this is not our show. It's the city's show, the state's show. And uh, we want it to be that way. What kind of a presence do you anticipate for the church during the Olympic Games? Well, to be helpful, we're putting on a gala in our great new conference center. We have a, we built a magnificent building here that seats 21,000 people. I think it's the largest religious building in the country, if not in the world. We're having a gala there each night for the entertainment of visitors. The Tabernacle Choir, uh, world famous, will put on with guest artists concerts here in the Tabernacle. Our family history resources will be open to visitors. In fact, they can wander anywhere around here and. We'll be happy to accommodate them, help them in any way that we can. You send missionaries from here all around the world. Yes, sir. To spread the word of the church. Right. Will you have a heavy concentration of missionaries in Salt Lake City doing that kind of work during the Olympics? No, not, we're not going to do any proselyting here. We don't intend to take undue advantage of this situation. We're going to be a part of the hosting force of this great community. What do you anticipate uh, will be the lasting effect for the church of having the Olympics in Salt Lake City? I think it'll be salutary. I think there will be a better understanding. As a result of people coming here, there are still all kinds of misconceptions. I think those will largely fade, and I think that our people the world over will we take some pride in the fact that we were here and a part of it when it all occurred. Mr. President, I know that you're aware that the Olympic Games are more than just athletic competition. They're also a big excuse to have a big party. Right. Your church is famous for its abstemious ways. Is that going to make you uncomfortable with all that's going to be going on here? Not a bit. Anybody who wants a drink can get a drink. The liquor laws of Utah are not unusually peculiar. Many states have peculiar liquor laws. Ours have been brought to the front by reason of this, but I think people will be accommodated. They can get what they wish. The Olympic Games are also known for their diversity, obviously. Men and women are uh, treated equally on the medal stand. Uh, people of all races, all backgrounds, all religions from all over the world come here. You're known within the church as a organization that is dominated primarily by white males. Do you think you'll hear a lot about the absence of diversity within the church? Oh, we may hear something about it, but there'll be no evidence of it, I think. Well, our women are, have their own great organization. They carry on. We, we have a marvelous uh, membership of women, their own organization, some five million strong, with their own officers, their own buildings. 
They get along pretty well. They're very proud of what they do. The church itself could stand a profit from a very successful Olympics because, after all, you're deeply involved in almost all the business enterprises of Salt Lake City. We have a few enterprises here, and we hope they won't, we're going to see to it, they won't take undue advantage of anybody who comes here. Well, I don't think that anyone expects uh, that anyone will be taken undue advantage of, but you're quite modest when you say you have just a few enterprises here. How much will it mean to the church in terms of the financial windfall? Oh, I don't think it'll mean a great deal. Our, we have broadcasting properties here, of course. We have a newspaper here. We have a real estate arm here. But uh, I, don't, I don't see any big, up, big upswing in profitability coming out of the Olympics. People are curious about how you divide your time between the matters of the soul and the matters of the bottom line within the church? Well, I have responsibility for everything that occurs in the church. And uh, uh, I give a great deal of time to the spiritual side of the church, the th theological side of the church. A little time, but not a great deal of time to the financial side of the church. We have good solid boards of directors for these organizations. We leave the running of these organizations largely in their hands. You say that you won't be proselytizing, but there is going to be an enormous amount of curiosity about the church itself, its place in the Utah culture and in the American West for that matter. Let's talk about some of the aspects of it. All right. About tithing. Uh, we're in a difficult American economy at the moment. Is it harder when there's a downturn in the economy to get the church members to tithe 10% of their salaries on a regular basis as it is during good times? Oh, I don't think so. Tithing is, is not a matter of money as it is a matter of faith. The faith will pay their tithing according to their income. We regard tithing as the Lord's law of finance. It's the law under which this church operates. If the income of the people goes down, the income to the church goes down. We do not go in debt. We watch ourselves very carefully in the handling of the resources of the church to see that we spend very carefully and within the limits of that which we have to spend. We regard the tithing funds as sacred money, the Lord's purse and we want to be very careful about how we spend it. As you look at the Lord's Purse in the current state of the economy and with all the dire predictions about the difficult road ahead, are you concerned about that? Well, we're, of course we're concerned. We're concerned that people are employed. Uh, unemployment is a terrible thing at any time in the history of any country. We hope that this down slide of employment will come to an end very quickly and that there comes some stability in our economic situation in the country. It affects the church, but we simply tailor our program to fit the purse. Has the church had to be more active in recent months than it might have been in the last several years in terms of helping out families who've fallen on hard times? Not appreciably yet. We haven't felt much effect yet. We're prepared should that happen. We have, as you know, a great welfare program. We try to take care of our own. We have farms and canneries and milk plant and all of those things, clothing operations, where we seek to produce goods to take care of our own and beyond that, to extend, extend humanitarian aid to those in distress, not of our faith, across the world. Last year, we contributed to humanitarian causes some $72 million. We just authorized a substantial gift of some $600 million of value and goods to the Afghan refugees. We're concerned with the welfare of people, the hunger of people, the distress that people feel. 
wherever they may be, we want to assist, and we're doing that very substantially. Not just the Mormons, but many Christian faiths believe that before the return of Jesus Christ, there could be a period of great turmoil. Yes. Did it cross your mind at all that what the United States has been going through with the war on terror may be a harbinger of that in any fashion? Well, of course, you think of those things, but personally, I feel this isn't the great winding up season. I think we're going to have some normalcy come out of all of this, hopefully before long, that will continue on and go forward. We've got a lot of work to do in this world. We've got to preach the gospel of peace. We've got to build in men's hearts a better understanding of one another, a greater appreciation for diversity, and uh, a greater appreciation of the needs who are those, of those in distress wherever they may be and herald the cause of peace that comes of the feeling that men have in their hearts. We have a great undertaking ahead of us, I believe. Some people see what is going on in the war on terrorism as a long twilight struggle between the Christian faith and Western culture and those people who are radical members of the Islamic faith. Do you share that view? I guess no one knows. We don't know the end of this. Uh, it's come upon us very suddenly. We don't know the end of it. We don't know the extent of it. We'll live through it. I, I believe that. I have confidence in that and great hope and pray for it. What about the role of the church in those areas that have become uh, ever more Islamic in their faith? Do you like to send your young missionaries to the Middle East, for example, in Southeast Asia? Well, we have them in Southeast Asia, of course. We don't have any activity of any consequence in the Muslim countries. But we're not, we don't consider this as a, as a contest between Christianity and Islam. A few people, extremists, who are really betrayers of their own faith, have caused this problem. And we look at it on that basis. You have worldwide now, what, 11 million members of the church? Something or above 11 million, yes. Some people have projected that by the year 2080 that you could have 265 million. That's the speculation. Is that your speculation as well? Oh, I don't know. We know that we're growing. We've grown consistently. The church has never been as large. It's never been as strong. It's never been in such solid condition as it is today. And we are growing. I don't know that we can make a rigid uh, calculation of the future. We'll just keep working and moving forward. But my guess is, Mr. President, that you have done some projections that uh, oh. among the elders you've talked about what your goals are. Well, we have to do some things because we have to build buildings. We have to train leadership uh, as we go across the world. Uh, there are some things we, of course, have to look ahead and plan ahead and make provision for the future. And when you make those provisions, do you come close to the number of 265 million by 2080? We haven't extended it out that far. That would make you the second largest religion in the world behind uh, Roman Catholicism within the Christian world. Well, this man up in Seattle has made that projection, and we're aware of it, but we don't talk about it. Really, we don't. We just, we plan a few years ahead and keep moving keep growing, keep expanding, hoping to do good wherever we go. Does it worry you when people make those kinds of projections? Does it make it harder for the church to then go off and proselytize in some areas? No, we just think it's interesting. Two-thirds of your new members, I'm told, are converts. Do they come to the church out of a sense of spirituality, or are they converts in large part because you're so skilled now at proselytizing and, in a way, marketing the appeal of the church? Oh, I don't know. They come for various reasons. 
I don't know that you can define that. Uh, we do carry on a proselytizing program, of course, but they come for all kinds of reasons. They see here an, an anchor of strength in a world of shifting values. They see our great emphasis on the family, on building strength within the family in a world where the family's falling apart. They sense such things as that. And furthermore, this church expects things of people. We're, it isn't easy to belong here and be active. We, we're a demanding people in many respects. We require activity and, and contribution and of time and effort and means and growth and leadership. And that all appeals to people. They see something very solid and substantial that they can get hold of and cling to. In the wake of the terrorist attacks on New York and in Washington, D.C., the uncertainty about biological warfare, most faiths saw a real return of the flock to services on Sunday yes. and a return to fundamental values. Yes. Was that true in your church as well? Oh, I don't know. I, uh, we've, I haven't noted that. I just think that we're going along and that our people are active. We have, of course, a very high rate of activity among our people. And uh, I just see that continuing. But those who look to us find strength and comfort and reassurance in these circumstances. We lost some people in these events. We're, our hearts reach out to all who have lost. We're so sympathetic toward those who have suffered so terribly in this unconscionable thing that has occurred. We want to be helpful. We want to give reassurance. We want to give comfort and strength and help wherever we can. Joseph Smith and Brigham Young obviously persisted against great odds, the face of mob violence against members of the church as well. Right. Look at where you are today. Right. Thriving, thriving faith and enterprise for that matter as well. But do you still to some degree see it as the church against the world or are those days gone by? No, we see it as a church for the world, not against the world. We're out there to help the world, to improve. We say to people, you take all that you have that is good and bring it and let us see if we can add to it. Now that's the substance of our program, our proselytizing program. You file whatever you have that you value and treasure and let us see if we can add to it. When other faiths in the Christian world continue to be critical of Mormons, saying that they're not really a part of the Christian faith, as a lifelong Mormon, how does that affect you personally? Well, it, I just think that comes of misunderstanding. <clears throat> of course we're a Christian church. The very name of the church denotes that. The central figure of our worship is the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the whole essence of that which we teach. Our first article of faith declares, we believe in God the Eternal Father and in His Son Jesus Christ and in the Holy Ghost. We believe that we are a Christian people. Our interpretation of some things may be different. And we are faced with that interpretation of the difference. But we, trade, we teach people. We try to educate them on this. But above all, we try to get along with them. We do not denigrate another man's religion in our activity. We never run down another church. We're positive in our approach and in our teaching and in our proselytizing and never critical of other people. Many people have said that the role of Jesus Christ has taken a more prominent place in the Mormon church in the last 25 years or so. Is that a fair observation? No, I don't think so. It appears that way to people, I think. I think as they've come to understand us better, they've come to that conclusion. They think we're becoming more mainstream and so on. 
But uh, actually, the theology of the church has not changed from the beginning. We're teaching the same doctrine as was taught in the early days of the church. Our methodology, our approach to problems, our handling of situations, alters according to the circumstances, but the basic doctrine remains the same. What troubles a lot of people of other faiths is that some of your ceremonies remain highly secret, in the, te in the temple, for example. Sacred, sacred. We regard the temple as the house of the Lord, a place of, that's very sacred to us. Now, before a temple is dedicated, it's open to the public. We're dedicating a temple up in the Northwest next Sunday. I'll be up there. And uh, uh, an open house is going on right now. Tens and tens of thousands of people are going through that building right now. We'll answer any question that they have. We'll open every facility of that building for them to see. But when that building is dedicated, a certain essence of sanctity rests upon it, and we so regard it as the house of the Lord, and it becomes a very sacred place to us. And for us, that sanctity obtains with reference to the temple, just as everybody in this world has certain things that are sacred and personal to him. But in all other houses of the Lord, it's all ye who are welcome to come here. Yes, sir. And they're all welcome to come there if they'll meet the requirements. To become a member of the church? Yes. Yes. But as an outsider, I can go even to a mosque, for example. You or, can. Or a Jewish temple. You can. And I'm welcome there. Yeah. Or as a Protestant, I can go to a Catholic service and I'll be welcome there. Right. And you can go to our services. We've got... Uh, In the temple? About 20... Uh, 20, uh, how many thousands of building con local congregations? We're building about 400 new churches a year. And you're always welcome to come there. But the temple remains a thing sacred to us. Now, when a temple grows old and undergoes extensive remodeling, as happens occasionally, we open it again and then rededicate it. But there are certain things that remain sacred to us, and we so regard them and so hold them. Do you think that the church at some point will have to make a greater effort to find common ground of understanding with the other faiths? I think we're doing it. We work very well with other churches on many, many things. We, uh, right here, we have fine relationship with the Catholic Church with many others. And I think uh, we're working in many areas in common causes in this country and elsewhere. We're becoming a force for good, recognized as such, with the numbers to accomplish great good. And uh, we work with others with similar desires and similar wishes, objectives in accomplishing certain good. How much is the relationship of polygamy to the history of the church still a problem for you? Well, it arises, of course. It's a thing of the past. It's behind us 110 years. It's a thing of the past, but of course, it still rises. It was one of those sensational things that people like to talk about, read about. There was so much misunderstanding of it. But it's pretty well behind us. It doesn't give us much trouble, really. When it does arise, as it has in recent years, should the church be more aggressive about making sure that all the members of the LDS understand that this is no longer acceptable? Yes, we, they know that. They know that. We've made that very clear. We've made that very clear. If I were a member of the church... You could be. <laughs> yes, I have that feeling. <laughs> I've run into your missionaries everywhere, as I've told you before, in the world. Yes. But what kind of behavior 
would cause me to be excommunicated. Immorality? If you were an adulterer? Something of that kind? If you undertook to practice polygamy? If you went out and spoke from a soapbox, so to speak, false doctrine? We might take some action against you after laboring with you. But we don't cut very many people off the church, very, very few in terms of percentage, really. When all said and done, very few. On that soapbox, if I were to be critical of the church or some practices of it, I'd be subject to excommunication. Oh, I don't depend on what you were doing. But we have many people within the church who are critical of some things. We're a, we're a very open people. We're an educated people. We maintain this tremendous university in Provo, Brigham Young University, with satellite campuses in Hawaii and in Idaho. Uh, I don't think we can be accused of being an ignorant, narrow-minded people. I think we're a very tolerant, understanding people and not quick to jump on people and cut them off the church. We work with them. We do all we can to help them. Do you think that the role of women in the church will change before too long? I don't know. I don't think so. The Lord will have to change it. And the women are so happy with what they have. There have been revelations in the past, however, about polygamy at the, yeah. at the end of the 19th century. Right. About the, about the possibility of black people becoming right. priests in the church, a revelation about that. Right. You don't anticipate that there will be a revelation about increasing the role of women? I have seen no signs of anything and have seen no need for it, really. No great clamor for it among our, the women of the church. Where we get along pretty well in our doctrine, under our philosophy, a man does not walk ahead of his wife. His wife does not walk ahead of the man. They walk side by side as equals before the Lord and as companions. Do you believe that man can become a god? Yes, I think he has within him the potential of godship. This, this concept of eternal growth, of development, is a part of our theology. We can improve our lives. Immortality is as much a certainty as is this life. And as we have lived and grown here, we will live and grow there. And someone can even be baptized after death. Yes, vicariously, a, st a living proxy in behalf of someone who's gone. Why is the genealogy project so important to the church? Because we believe in the sanctity and the eternity of the family. That the family can be an eternal relationship of father and mother and children. And chains of families are so very important. And so we carry forward this great family history research program and have become one of the great resources of the world in this activity. Some people say it's a little unnerving. The church has so much information on all of us, they're just going to use that information to pull us all into their fold. Oh, we're not going to abuse anything of the kind. Nobody's under any duress and under any obligation in this life or the next to accept that which we have to offer. When you accumulate all of this information, are you sometimes astonished at the ease with which you can get it? Well, I don't know. We just plow. We just keep going. Uh, we make our resources available to everybody. 60% of those who use our family history resources are not members of the church. We have this great library here with all of its facilities. But we have satellite libraries all across the country, Canada, in other parts of the world that are available to everybody. Our records are open to everyone who wishes to use them. In some ways, 
has that made the church more user-friendly to people? Oh, I think so. I think they've appreciated it. Yes, very much so. I come from a, an unusual situation. On my mother's side, they were Irish-American. On my father's side, they were Huguenots. Mm -hmm. We share. I know that. <laughs> you know that because you have a large book about it right there. Yes, sir. You wanted to know a little about me, so I thought I'd like to know a little about you. And our family history people were put to work, and they've compiled here a very, very interesting chronology of your family history, reaching back several generations, back into the old world. And I want to tell you, Tom, you have good ancestry. No horse thieves have been found. Nobody been hanged for what he did, but good, solid, honest, hardworking people That's so who relieved. made a difference. Who made a difference. Wasn't that gratifying? Yes, sir. It's, it's a wonderful story, and these are all from the original sources, copies of these documents. I hope you'll enjoy it. We're happy to present it to you. The Brokaw family line, your father's family, your paternal background, and the Conley family, your mother's line. And along with it, a CD of this same record. But we hope that you'll accept this and that you'll spend pleasant hours studying these many documents and that it'll become a source of satisfaction and really of pride because you can take pride in your ancestry. Well, I thank you very much, President Hinckley, and on behalf of the Brokaw and the Connolly family, I'm, I'm very grateful to you for that. You're most welcome. I, I am happy to know that there were no horse thieves back there. <laughs> we haven't found any. <laughs> well, maybe they were especially skilled at hiding out. Who knows? No, I think they were good people. They were solid people. They were hardworking people. They were hardworking indeed. They were the, they were the very fiber of what has made America great. The common, good, hard-working, honest people, men and women of integrity and substance who did things to make the world better. And that's the essence of the hope of the church as well, isn't it? Absolutely. Our whole program is designed to make bad men good and good men better. Do you think other faiths in the Christian world will ever learn to accept the Book of Mormon? I don't know. I don't know. It's available to them. I don't know. I would think they would welcome it. It stands as another witness for Jesus Christ. It is not contradictory to the Bible. The Bible is our foundation scripture. The Book of Mormon is a companion volume that testifies of Jesus Christ. And it has affected the lives, the hearts, the souls of millions of people who have read it. The test lies in the prayerful reading of the book. Uh, anybody who will read the book carefully and prayerfully, I believe, will come to an appreciation for this great and remarkable volume. I think what troubles a lot of people from other faiths within the Christian world is that it came so late and it took the story of Jesus in a whole different plane. I think that's possible. I think that's possible. I can understand why people question it, why they criticize it. It's perfectly obvious to me. But I repeat, the test lies in the reading. If they will read it, if they will pray about it, if they will ask God about it, I believe they'll come to an appreciation for it. The fact of the matter is that we're printing more copies of the Book of Mormon than ever before in the history of the church. It's been translated into more languages than ever before in the history of the church. It's touched more people's lives across the world than ever before in the history of the church. And I suppose that's the real test of it. One of the great epic stories in America is the great trek of Brigham Young and his followers into this valley. Right. What do you think he would think of Salt Lake City and environs now? 
I think he'd be really quite amazed. I think he had a great prophetic vision of what would happen here. But to see what has actually happened here, and to see the world coming here, and becoming acquainted with what he had so much to do with, would be a very satisfying thing to him. I have a portrait of him right behind my desk. And every once in a while, when I have a serious problem, I kind of turn around in my chair and look at him and say, what would you do? And he, I see him smile and say, carry on, boy. <laughs> <laughs> when you have those difficult moments and you think about that trek, it must put your difficult moments in some appropriate perspective. It does. When I think of those times, those very difficult times, my grandfather came across the plains, buried his wife uh, out near, uh, uh, out on in the Nebraska. Or, Sand Hills. Or out in that area somewhere. His wife and his brother-in-law on the same day and carried a three months old baby to this valley. I know something about this. I'm only the third generation. My grandfather, my father, and myself spanning that period of church history. And I think I know something of what it cost. The price that was paid by those people in settling this area, in building a commonwealth here, in establishing a civilization here, and in laying a foundation for the wonderful things that we have today, I'm just overwhelmed with a great sense of gratitude and appreciation. The church reaches out beyond the Mormon community in its philanthropic efforts. Oh yes, very much so, substantially so. We just authorized last week sending $600,000 worth of goods and medicine, blankets and clothing, to Afghanistan to assist the refugees there. Now we support the President of the United States in what's going on, but at the same time we're conscious of and aware of the suffering of so many innocent people, children in that area that we have or seek to help them, to assist them, as we have sought to help people in other parts of the world over a period of many years. In the Book of Mormons, you believe that Jesus came to North America. Yes, sir. Following his resurrection, he visited North America. We believe that and taught here and established his church here and confirmed the reality of his presence as the Son of God, as the Redeemer of the world, who gave his life to atone for the sins of mankind. If you believe that, do you also believe, therefore, that the presence of the Mormon Church, especially in the Western United States, brings you closer to him than some other faiths? Well, I don't know. I can't judge other faiths. I think that certainly has an, an influence upon our people in bringing them closer to him without any question. That added witness is a very important thing. The Bible says, in the mouths of two or more witnesses shall all things be established. There is the scripture of the old world, the Bible, that testifies of Jesus Christ. There is the scripture of the new world, the Book of Mormon, that testifies of Jesus, Smith, of Jesus Christ. And they go hand in hand in witness and testimony of the Son of God. And let me be clear, if I wanted to become a member of the church. Yes, sir. And I were taken into a temple for the induction ceremonies. Yes, sir. Other members of my family who chose not to join me in all of that would not be welcome. They would be welcome to a room in the temple where they could not be within the sacred area itself, but they'd be made welcome to come there and be with someone who could help them understand what was going on, yes. But if I were to become a member of the Episcopal Church or a Methodist, I would undergo some instruction. There would be a public ceremony yep. in which I would be accepted into the church. As I understand it, if I were to become a member of your church, 
it would be more involved than that. I'd even be given special garments to wear. Oh, no, 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 no. To become a member? Yeah. No, no. You would uh, be baptized, of course. That would, you could have your entire family there, anyone you wanted. We'd encourage them to be there, to witness what goes on in the, as you're becoming a member. It's only later when you might qualify to go to the temple that the matter of the sanctity of the temple would obtain, but not in your becoming a member. And what about the garments? Well, the garments, we wear a sacred protective garment, as we call it, uh, which every, many people dress according to certain customs and, and uh, things that their affiliation requires. The Jewish people do, many other people do. And we carry a sacred thing which we describe as being a holy and sacred thing for us. You wanted to say something else to me as well. Now, the Olympics are coming. We have a tremendous asset here which is recognized. We have thousands of young men and women who have served as missionaries across the world. They learn the languages, they have learned the languages of the lands in which they serve. Japan, Korea, uh, Mongolia. Mongolia, Sweden, Denmark, Holland, whatever. They are a tremendous asset as people from the earth gather here. And we have badges. I speak English or I speak French, or I speak Dutch, or I speak German, which will be made available to people. And those who speak the languages and would are acquainted with them will be there to assist them, and they'll serve as volunteers on a volunteer basis. Again, I say, not to proselyte, but to talk to the people about what their interest is and what's going on. But what happens if somebody from Norway says to one of your young missionaries who's there just to help him get through the game, I'd like to know more about the church. You tell him to go and, and uh, come to the tabernacle and listen to the concert, to go to the, co the uh, conference hall and listen to the gala, and when he gets home to look up the missionaries. 